Welcome to this new life. We're so glad you're watching. Today we are going to see episode two of this series about Jesus being crucified and how we can respond to him. I'm excited about this series we are going to share about now. It is about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and what happened on that cross, how Jesus came to save us, but also about from our side, what is our response to this crucifixion of this Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross. Let's start out reading about the crucifixion of Jesus from the Gospel of John chapter 19, verse 17 to 30. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgatha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, uh, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sisters, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalena. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It was a common thing in the Roman Empire to crucify people that was being sentenced to death. So the thing that Jesus was being crucified was not anything unusual. But this was not traditional common way of uh, punishing a person or sentence a person in Israel. But this was common practice in the Roman Empire. And it is a confirmed historical fact that Jesus was being crucified. This was the way that the Roman community simply punished people to be sentenced to death. But Jesus was not a criminal. Jesus was the Son of God. The Bible says that he was without sin. So the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was something that God has planned from the very beginning, not for punishment, but for salvation for you and for I. There's many prophecies in the, all through the scriptures that is pointing to this historical event to take place, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. One of the most amazing and accurate prophecies we read in the prophet of Isaiah chapter 53. 
there in details. We read both how and why Jesus, he was being crucified. And even people who is not a believer of Jesus must admit that this prophetic word, given hundreds and hundreds of years before this event taking place, that this was something that truly was pointing to this crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So let's read Isaiah chapter 53. Who has delivered our report? And to whom has the, the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when he, we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers it is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of many he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked. But when the rich of his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased to the Lord to bruise him. He was put him to grief. When you make, soul, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servants shall justify many, for he shall bear his iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Here we read about Jesus and the crucifixion of him. There was a very reason Jesus was crucified, not because he was a criminal, but because of this. On that cross, Jesus did something for you. He was crucified to become your savior. He was crucified to be able to uh, bring an atonement for your sins. He was crucified to become your Redeemer. This was what Jesus did for you on the cross. And let me just share with you four things that happens for you that Jesus did for you on that cross. Number one, on that cross, we read that we got forgiveness from our sins through the blood of Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, it says... He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says how we are all sinners. Every one of us has committed sin. Something that is wrong motive, a lie, bad thoughts in mind and hearts, evil deeds we have done, selfishness, the list is long. Things that we have done that would not be able to stand in the holiness and purity and presence of the living God. But Jesus had done no sin. That's why he came here on earth to give himself as an atonement for us. That our sins should be washed away. And there's only one detergent that can wash away the sin of a man's heart. And that is the blood of Jesus. That's the number one thing that Jesus did for you on that cross. He washed our sins away. 
The second thing that happened when Jesus gave his life on that cross was that it was a redemption for us. On that cross, we were delivered from evil. We were delivered from having a future in hell and eternal punishment. And instead, he brought us into having eternal life. He redeemed us from all the consequences that sin brought with it into this world. What about things like no peace of heart, no deep joy or knowing things is all right. Jesus has delivered from us from all of that. Even the Bible says that there's help in any area of our life as we walk through this life because of that redemption that Jesus Christ, he brought to us on that cross. This does not mean that we cannot be sick or we cannot have problems or, or evil cannot happen. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying in the midst of all of this, that God has sent his son that we should get redeemed from this. We don't have to go through all this in our own strength and power. There's somebody that was sent to redeem us from this. That happened on that cross. The third thing that happened when Jesus gave his own life on that cross was that he brought us back into relationship with the living God. What a powerful, powerful word this is. Relationship. You know, <clears throat> most people want and is seeking divine divinity and trying to find the divine somehow, trying all they can. And often they realize that maybe some of it is more that we should not upset or make the God we worship uh, mad or is to keep away evil from our life. But what Jesus did on that cross was that he was offering us that we could come into through relationship and fellowship with him. That's what Jesus did on the cross. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says like this, As many as received him, to them he saved the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Isn't that amazing? It did not say he delivered us that we could become slaves or acquainted with but actually we will get into such a close relationship as when you imagine your own family, that we will become member of the family of God, that he has saved us into that. That was what happened on that cross, that he took our hand, whoever received this Jesus, he took our hand and he brought us back into a living fellowship with the living God. And the third, fourth and last thing Jesus did on that cross was that he provided eternal life. The Gospel of John chapter 3 verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Everlasting life in heaven. How amazing this is. This is what Jesus did for us. And the thing is that Jesus says that he is the way, the life and the truth. John 14 verse 6. I am the way, the truth and the life. How amazing this is. And no one comes to the Father, he says, except through me. This means that through Jesus, you can come to God in heaven. Through Jesus, you can receive this eternal life. You can receive redemption in this situation and what you are ending up in. You can receive forgiveness of your sins. And you can receive the presence, the life of God. All this was what Jesus did for you on the cross. How amazing this is. That's why Jesus Christ was crucified. And you know, all these scriptures in the Bible is pointing to this. So this event that Jesus was being crucified has been planned for thousands of years. Yes, even before the creation of the world, that Jesus someday should come and be the Redeemer, the Savior of mankind. So this was not a coincidence which was going on that day when Jesus was being 
crucified. It was planned into details, planned in heaven, made in heaven, because God loves you and He wants to send salvation to us. This was what Jesus did for you. Now the question is this, how have you responded? What have been your return back to Jesus? Now there's five different groups of people as we read about in this passage of the crucifixion of Jesus that is responding in five different ways. The first group was represented by the Roman prefect Pilate and how fear of man can keep us away from having Jesus Christ as our Savior. The second group is represented by the religious people at that time. These people was uh, in many ways seeking God and trying to find their way back to God. They had their rituals, they had their religious traditions, the way of being dressed, the way of doing things. Certain days they were doing certain things. They were even praying to God. And in that way they were hoping even for God to send a Savior. But when Jesus Christ then stepped forward as being the Savior of mankind, they rejected Him because something had happened. They have started to put their trust in religious rituals, religious traditions, religious deeds, the way of speaking, the way of doing things, certain times doing certain things. So in that way, they started to believe that they actually could make their way back to God in themselves. But this is dangerous because we cannot make our way back to God in our own deeds. Smoking incense or lighting a little candle or doing certain rituals, the Bible says has no salvation into it. I know that traditions and rituals can have many good purposes and many good things in it, but it can never save us. It's like thinking that we can save ourselves, which is not possible. I've traveled all over the world. I've seen how people with much eager and effort try to, to come back to God, how they have done many things and given many sacrifices in order to try to please the God that they serve. But the thing is that all these deeds and rituals will never ever wash away our sins. There's one thing that's for sure, and that is we have all sinned. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and lost the glory of God. The second thing is this, that we cannot save ourselves. No matter how much we try to make up for these sins, it is not possible. No matter how many rituals, how many good deeds we are doing, we are not able to reach heaven on our own. I don't know your present faith. I don't know your eagerness and your intensity in trying to worship. But I do know this, that Jesus Christ came to save us because we could not come and save ourselves. We are all sinners. We do all need a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. Let us not put our entire trust in the salvation of mankind. Let us not put all our trust in traditions. I know many of us might have grown up with doing certain things in certain ways, but when we sit down and we are honest to ourselves, do we truly believe that that contains eternal life to us? These religious people, when Pilate, the Roman prefect, when he was asking them, you know, what shall I do with this Jesus? These religious people were those who started to yell and say, crucify him, 
crucify him. Isn't that incredible? Their entire life, for hundreds and hundreds of years of traditions, the tradition actually wanted to point forward to this Savior that they were waiting. But when he was there standing right in front of them, all these traditions and rituals actually blindfolded them on the same time. Let's not be blindfolded like these religious people. Let's not think that there's anything good in ourselves that's able to make our own way back to heaven. No matter how much money you donate to good purposes, to the poor, to noble things, you know, that money, those sacrifices is not able to save us. No matter how many candles we want to lit, no matter how many, much smoking incense we are giving, no matter how many times we do things or rituals a day or a week, no matter how much effort we put into our life and our spiritual life, we must admit this, that we need something from outside to come and save us. Imagine yourself that you are in a lake drowning. You're struggling with all your efforts. You're doing all the right things. You're quoting and saying all the right things as you're struggling there about to drown. You're dressed in the perfect way. And still all these things is not able to save you. You need somebody coming from the outside who's not drowning himself to throw you a lifeline. That lifeline is Jesus Christ. He's the one that you can grab and he will be able to pull you back to shore and save you. He's that lifeline from God, the savior for you and for me. Do you realize that you can today, instead of putting your trust in religious rituals and traditions that you today can shift over and instead decide that you're going to put your trust in the lifeline, that you're going to put your trust that what the Bible says, as we read in the beginning, that Jesus Christ came and was crucified in order to save us. As we did here in the beginning and read in the different scriptures today, that Jesus Christ came to save us, that if we believe in him to be our savior, then he will save us, that he can make us a child of God, not a slave, not a worker, but a child, that he can truly give us eternal life. If you instead will put your trust in him, instead of all the rituals and religious system that you're part of right now, then he will save you. And I know you're sitting watching this and in your heart, you know, this is right, that you need Jesus to be your savior. Do you then know he's just one prayer away from you? We're going to pray this prayer right now. A prayer where you can join us, where you can pray from your heart with your mouth and ask Jesus to be your lifeline, to be your savior. Ask Jesus to pull you out of that situation where you're drowning and instead come and put your trust in him. Why don't you put your hand upon your heart right now and then pray this prayer together with me. Close your eyes and from your heart, join me in this prayer. Jesus Christ, I believe. You're the son of God, that you're the lifeline, that you're the savior that God has sent. Save me, forgive my sins. I come to you, be my savior, be my Lord. Give me your eternal life. I will follow you. I will worship you every day, the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. 
when you prayed this prayer from your heart. Jesus did hear that prayer with his heart. Now it's just important that you keep yourself close to Jesus every day the rest of your life. That you keep him in your heart as your Savior. Let me give you quickly three advices that will help you in doing so. Number one, pray to Jesus every day. You can pray to Jesus at any time, at any position. It's like talking with your best friend. Don't pray to any other name. Pray in the name of Jesus. Number two, when we read in the Bible, we learn more about Jesus. It will feed us our spirit. It will get us to get more revelation and acknowledge and know-how in our life and walk with Jesus. Maybe you don't have a Bible, but then maybe you have a smartphone where you can download the Bible in your language for free. Or maybe you know of somebody who has a Bible. Why don't you ask that person if you can read in the Bible together? The third thing that will help you to stay close to Jesus is this. You need to be part of a fellowship of others who is worshiping Jesus. Maybe you know of there's a, a fellowship like that in your neighborhood, a good Christian church or somebody you know of who's also a follower of Jesus. Why don't you ask if you could be part of that fellowship as well? Or maybe you sit and you think, but I don't know of any. And I'm in a situation, I'm living in a place where it's not possible to openly come and join a fellowship like that. Then this channel, these broadcasts, can be a way of having fellowship together. All these programs that has been broadcast on these channels, why don't you then join in that and have fellowship in this way? Also, there is a call center. You are so welcome to contact us in this call center. Maybe you prayed this prayer of salvation. Let us know. Maybe you have a prayer request. Or maybe you have some questions. Why don't you take a moment and contact our call center? There will be people there that will be very happy to help you, to guide you, to pray with you and to connect with you. You have been watching this new life. We are so glad you have been there. Make sure to join us next week where we are going to see episode three of what Jesus did on the cross and how we can respond to this. May God bless you and may he be with you. Mm -hmm.